62. There we go. And we are live. Episode 62. Vic and I are both feeling under the weather. <laughs> and, if, and if you managed to talk to myself at the event, I was probably the worst condition I've ever played Warhammer in. <laughs> D- Dave was in uh, full Batman mode and uh, it's he's, he's progressively improved now. He actually, you know, can talk at a little bit of volume. So <laughs> I, was, I was dying on the weekend. That was bad. <laughs> Well, welcome back, everyone, to episode 62 of 40K Fireside. We've just come back from the London Grand Tournament, the LGT, and uh, it was an absolute blast. Uh, the uh, Ignite team showed up in force, <laughs> and uh, we even managed to have a finals of Ignite versus Ignite, which oh. was uh, which is the dream, really. First, Actually, that's the first time I think it might have happened <laughs> yeah, in any so tournament, cool. right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure finals, it's the first time, yeah. very the finals. finals. Yeah. You might be right, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go through quite a bit of stuff. Kind of uh, talk a little bit about what we our experiences were, what our mm-hmm. run was, what we played against. But kind of keep that a bit brief because it's a very interesting meta, and we have a lot to discuss within the meta. Yeah. Um, we've also got a balance slate potentially around the corner, so want to just kind of give our ideas and what we think would help to improve the game. Yep. Um, so. We're not going to use a whole hour and a half or whatever it is to go through and dissect every single <laughs> yeah, uh, minutiae of games. <laughs> so we on the agenda for today, we have uh, three things. Brief discussion of games, armies that did well, and kind of reviewing what we thought uh, on the previous episode, um, we would do what would do well and what wouldn't, and what we think, uh, what we'd want in the balanced data state. So a bit of a, bit of a wish list here. So, But before yeah. that, we've got some uh, support that we'd like to give. So yeah. Vic, I'll click it over to you. Sweet, cheers. Yeah, so um, I had a, a fellow called Aaron from America contact me, and he's been messaging me a little bit. He's a beautiful painter and everything, but he, he had, he's working on an initiative at the moment with the American Cancer Society, um, which is called the Battle for Breast Cancer. Yeah, Battle Against Breast Cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a massive series of tournaments which are being run in America. At the moment, it looks like there's 26 tournaments, um, which is going to be streamed by four different streaming platforms, Tactical Tortoise, War Games Live, Tabletop Live, Warp Charge Gaming. And um, the aim is to kind of raise some money for the battle mm-hmm. against breast cancer. Um, there's a raffle, which is one of the main ways of donating to it. And I'm going to put uh, all of the information and a link to kind of purchase the raffle tickets. Um, Aaron did message me and say that if you use the code FIRESIDE, uh, if you spend at least $25, you'll get 15% off on your donation. So um, that is quite a cool initiative, I think, within yeah. Warhammer and Wargaming in general. And I think, yeah. you know, we've got to support things like this. So props to Aaron and everyone involved with this process. And guys, check it out. Check out the link and just see what you think. And maybe follow some of these tournaments and donate a little bit of cash if you can. Yeah, for sure. And I think the raffle is such a cool idea as well, right? Yeah. You're donating to charity and then you're also obviously raising money and then you have a chance to win something as well so i'm going to be buying a raffle ticket that sounds <laughs> awesome i don't even know what the prizes are but i'm going to do that i hope i hope they grow to a massive thing as well and i think it's so cool like uh there's also uh what's the other charity hammer that has the big charity, uh, charity yeah, the event thing. of the year as well which mm-hmm. is uh, awesome as well so i know the community can come together and uh, do some stuff so please if you are listening buy a raffle ticket you could win some awesome stuff as well and uh, and support a really awesome course yeah thanks for getting in touch Aaron and uh yeah, yeah. brilliant let's let's get back to back to it Dave oh, here we go. Grand tournament fantastic LGT already historically I've done fucking terrible <laughs> <laughs> not much has changed but uh um I managed to come uh ninth place Manny team and dropped which actually bumped me up to eighth on oh, the total rankings yes. oh, thanks Manny um but uh, eighth, ninth, around there, um, losing in the shadow round, the infamous shadow round. Uh, didn't have enough battle points to pick, uh, squeak through on that one. Uh, mm-hmm. So going six and one, losing to my uh, my friend and my neighbor and the guy that I commute with, uh, Lewis Smith, by the Tiger Shark, uh, who uh, we, play, <laughs> we play quite regularly. We play Marvel Crisis Protocol with. So at least um, when I was beginning my shadow round game at like, nine o'clock at night i got to play a super chill game with lewis so uh that was awesome um we we kind of had a uh, laugh at the end the winner can get to the end of the top eight and pay for the uber home <laughs> that was awesome yeah. how about yourself Vic? That, that's a pretty good run dave uh that's, yeah. that's not bad at all man ending yep. up eighth at uh at lgt is brilliant um i have historically done quite well at lgt mm-hmm. usually Definitely. it works out quite well for me but this time 
Manny Chima may have gained your extra place, but he oh. managed to defeat me during my uh, oh. my first five games, which took me out of the uh, out of the running to to play in any of the the cutoff games. So um, I, I had my sisters. Uh, it's quite a boring archetype, I would say. I wanted to ask a question. I wanted <laughs> yeah, to ask go a question because after the tournament and and on a on a side tangent note, it's it's very easy to. It's actually quite difficult to analyze a tournament and your results in the tournament uh, after you play one, right? Because it's very mm-hmm. easy to go into kind of rose tinted mindset or hindsight is twenty twenty. I should have done X and Y. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually, what's usually what's best is if someone else does that alongside you to be like keep you kind of in check of like, well, you couldn't have actually controlled this. You could have controlled that, for example. Mm-hmm. But the big question I have because I thought that no one actually ran this sisters list because we had sisters is like the best performing list. Just no exorcists, no Val Valgon suits, just straight up Castigators, Dominion, Seraphim. Would that list have been better than the Exorcists? I gotta ask. Um Well, there comes a point, right? I mean, you, you max out, right? You get 30 Seraphim, you get three Dominion squads and emulators and the castigators, and then you get the triumph. And you 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 you're on your two thousand points at that stage, you know? Mm. And actually, when you start mixing and matching a few little bits here and there, I think the list does become stronger. Like it, it only takes one of those Dominion squads with, in an emulator, which is a bit redundant because it probably doesn't have the best place to go to suddenly be, work its way towards being two Exorcist of Vols unit. Mm. And I think that exact transition between those two is, is probably the decision that a lot of people made. Mm-hmm. What is quite interesting is the number of Seraphim people took. I think, mm. you know, there, there is an opportunity to take more Seraphim. It's very interesting, Dave. And, you know, I, I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit here, but I, I want to make this point because the meta is so incredibly balanced at the moment mm-hmm. that when it comes to designing your list, I, I personally look at what are the main threats in the meta? What am I worried about? I'm worried about 18 Bulgren. I'm worried about this Tesseract Vault and Monolith uh, Necron big stuff army. I'm worried about Sisters and I'm worried about Dark Angels. All of the above are tough. Three out of four of them have vehicles in them. Mm-hmm. So are you going to skew into Seraphim there? Or are you going to skew into Anti-Vehicle mm-hmm. and take the couple of Exorcists or Morven Val? And For I sure. think that was probably the decision point that happened. Mm-hmm. Now, the issue is, in a metal like this, it's not just those four armies that are good. And in fact, those four armies are not necessarily extremely represented. And not, they, none of them won the tournament. Yeah. Um, none of and, those were in, uh, one of those were in the top eight. Yeah. Y- yeah. Well, I guess the Morgan scene, right? Yeah. Uh, right. And, and the Necron list. So, uh, yeah, there was they, they were in there, but no Dark Angels, no Sisters. Mm. Um, so that means that there's so much stuff that's viable here that you you probably don't want to be the person running the list that everyone else is planning on dealing with. Mm, you want yep. to be the other person. You know? Exactly. Super interesting. <laughs> we are definitely skipping ahead. Because this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's it, like, but conversations like, like that are uh, such a critical way to improving as a Warhammer player from a mm-hmm. tournament to a tournament uh, kind of perspective, right? You know, what is the meta like now? How am I playing a list that's better positioned for the tournament, for example, right? Or how am I making those critical decisions about my list and the last points where um, it's better for the next tournament, given that how we think kind of the macro psychology of players is going to, um, you know, skew their list, right? Mm -hmm. So coming back around to your question that you asked me, would I have been better positioned if I had taken, say, a sister's list and just like spammed out the good stuff? I think I would have been better to, for example, take Eldar oh. and just created this random nonsense that people yep. will never have practiced against. Yep. They won't know suddenly this death chest is going to do 12 mortal wounds to you, you know, <laughs> it's, but it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know. So good. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Like I think the results from the LGT, I think are a, a super positive Thing for warhammer as a whole like mm-hmm. there's nothing there's nothing else you can take away from that is that mm-hmm. the meta in the game is in such a better position than it had previously been so yeah awesome anyway the lgt i was going to say as a whole uh the density when i when i was looking through the top 50 players uh the density of good players that attend to lgt is pretty insane right like mm-hmm. if you look at the top 50 or, or the top x and one bracket for example right because X and one, by the way, goes from like 16th position to like 
135th position. So, I mean, there's a huge corpus of people there. But I, I thought actually this was one of the densest LGTs. If you looked at, um, if you look at uh, the, the top players at, at ten, attending, for example, and I know Vic and I have both attended um, LVO, for example, which is a similar sized tournament of similar player capacity. And um, I thought this LGT in, in particular was significantly harder than what I thought um, LVOs of the past, which I had attended, uh, or maybe will even be in the future. So an interesting, an interesting point of comparison. And obviously mm. I'm a bit biased here, uh, but um, I, I just think, you know, the, the, the amount, the average player skill at, uh, at LGT is particularly of the people that were in contention for making like top 16, top 25 or something like that was uh, ridiculous, I thought. like, I think things are changing, Dave. I okay. think... Cop-out answer, but sure. No, no, <laughs> I think things are changing because when we think who are the best players, hmm. you know, even a couple of years ago, we probably only have like three or four names. We'll say like, oh, this person's a star player, you know, celebrity hmm, yeah. player. They're going to win anything they go to. Things have changed so much because there are so many players who are just as good as these players now. Yeah. Perfect example. You played Lewis, right? Yes. Yeah. Lewis beat you and Nas mm -hmm. with yep. his Tau. And not just, you know, forget that, that he beat you guys. You guys are scrubs. <laughs> but he was phenomenal when he was playing yeah. the game. He was extremely, extremely good. good. And I think there are so many players like that that just exist and are coming out of the, the kind of the cracks, yep. getting really good practice games against other really good players that they may not have connected with before. TTS is a part of that. These big tournaments are a part of that. The internet sharing all of this information, Discord is a part of that. Mm -hmm. I think the number, and, I, and I'm not sure if it's exactly an America versus USA thing. I have a feeling the, you know, the competition in LVO and America might improve as well because we had Americans, we had Scott Ketchum come over from USA. Yep, for sure. And X and one. Yeah, well, he yeah he 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 went five and zero, oh, and then he went oh and sorry he lost five his game. and zero. Oh. Oh, yeah, Scott. he went five and zero. Oh, smashed him, bro. It. And and he only yeah, got yeah. he he only lost the game because he got clocked out. So oh, right, he, yeah. he was well and truly winning the game. So um, there's an improvement in player skill of a lot of people who you wouldn't say are the celebrity players, mm -hmm. but are just as good as them. And I guess, you know, the faction balance obviously has a big part to play with exactly. that as well, right? Typically mm -hmm. players, I mean, obviously I'm included in that, would jump, would play factions that are obviously very strong to historically mm -hmm. over the last, you know, three or four years, for example. Um, and I, I guess, you know, apart from, a, apart from a couple of people, which I think spring to everyone uh, that I know is mine, players are probably more associated now with factions rather than like an actual player ranking, so to speak, if you know what I mean, like a hierarchy or like oh i think these are the best five players in the world you know it's probably more like this is the best t suns player or, or you know he's one of the best this or players are more attached to factions potentially mm -hmm. here now which is a bit of a shift from historically where it might be where players would typically jump around and play different things uh, mm -hmm. on a regular basis right yeah and i think people can be successful while being faction specialists in a metal yep. like this so yeah Maybe i being... completely agree with you a faction specialist is maybe the most important thing. We're going to decide. Oh, and, uh... <laughs> I think so. I think there you, we go. you might be onto something. Uh, well, Dave, a quick rundown list, your games, sure. any interesting points? Yeah, so I was playing, uh, obviously playing Guard. Uh, I was probably the only person, again, playing no Platoon Command Squad. <laughs> um, apart from there was uh, maybe one or two guys that are playing the... Uh, the Militarum uh, Scion regimented list, which doesn't, uh, doesn't require it. But um, yeah... Uh, Guard, I mean, 18 Bulgarin, two Chimeras, Hellhound, Lemuros Battle Tank, Tank Commander, Gaunt's Ghost. Uh, had the 15-man Scion Brick with the Command Squad, and they had the 5-man Scion. Both of those were really, really good. Had the Rapier Laser Destroyer Battery, and then I had the 1 times 3 uh, Scout Sentinels. And the 3-man the, the Scout Sentinel was probably what put me a different from anyone else in the tournament. I think it was like the only one running that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I... Probably wouldn't change anything in the list if I were to submit it again, actually. So felt like every game I had a, a really good chance at winning. Uh, and actually, in reality, it was a couple of things outside my control that uh, resulted in me either, you know, taking a loss, for example. Um, so I was uh, super happy with the list. Um, it was a bunch of fun to play. Gaunt's Ghosts were absolutely fun to play the whole weekend as well. Once I actually understood what weapons they had. <laughs> uh, and then the Scion Brick was probably my funnest unit to play. Uh, it definitely won me a couple of games just almost outright. So um, super fun unit. You can rapid ingress at Overwatch if someone's on an objective and wants to charge you. 
you always rapid ingress them because then they can move nine and you can order them twice after that and then they can just blast an infantry unit blast something on an objective um super fun unit you're just you know rolling dice for a bunch of time and exploding nice. six lethal six and everything so um super fun unit to play and uh yeah the 18 ball are obviously really powerful but uh if you watch my stream game i i play them really defensively i don't uh, i don't just stat check people with them at all i almost only exclusively use them on turn four and five and um yeah o overall i thought guard were in a good place i don't know if they were as high as we gave them credit for in terms of like their strength in the meta but I think had I'd made the top eight, I would have been feeling very confident into everyone's list in the in the top eight for sure. I don't think that I would have unfavored myself against any list there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Brian game was Orcs would have been interesting, but I know Borgren are particularly good there. Necrons, um, you know, have a great tagging capability. Uh, the Tau one, which is, is, is probably not favored, but we can get onto that later uh, as well. But how mm -hmm. about yourself? Uh, obviously, we just talked talk about the Exorcist. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, so yeah, I had a little modified bringers of flame list running, uh, taking in two exorcists while still maintaining kind of the three castigators and two of the immolators. So quite vehicle heavy on that. Uh, I had to sacrifice some seraphim, so I went down to 20 seraphims, so still a good amount, 10, 5, 5, uh, and a bunch of nonsense characters, two canonesses, two dialogus, and uh, we, we still had the triumph in there, of course. What was the best exorcist shot you got all weekend? Oh, exorcist, exorcist was. Uh, I took a massive chunk out of the great unclean one. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> I mean, it's good and bad because I will, I will, that'll be my game to discuss. Everyone mm, loves yeah. talking about the game they lost, but you know, if I shoot the great unclean one and take a chunk out of it, I probably shouldn't have shot the great unclean one. Should have shot something else. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine what that would have done anywhere else. <laughs> you would have one shot anything else in the game. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean the exes are swingy but they create momentum through the game hmm. um they're extremely good at picking up vehicles yep. um i mean it's basically a demolisher cannon but with longer range right right yeah, yeah. so it's it is 10 strength 10 ap3 and d6 damage firing in directly hmm. and you have a reroll once to wound or so it's actually even though it's swingy it kind of becomes consistent with miracle dice thrown in for the damage yeah especially the killing little vehicles um, I mean, I ended up playing against uh, Guard with loads of vehicles. Then I played against Custodes. I played against Dark Angels. Those are my first three games. Exorcists are brilliant in all three of those. And they almost single-handedly win all three of those games. It's awesome, yeah. <laughs> um, do we want to do you want to chat about the game that uh, the, your game that you lost against Manny Chima and yeah, round, yeah. round four was it? Round yeah. four is always a spicy one, isn't it? Because you get the pairings at nighttime and uh... yeah. I mean, this is an interesting one because I have a problem, Dave. Like I, I, historically, I've been very good at fighting uphill, you know, okay. like I have the list disadvantage and I'm like locked in, I'm playing really well. I'm kind of squeezing everything out. Surprise. I managed to win this game somehow, but I'm very bad at playing downhill. Okay. If, if I look at my losses in singles, they've all been downhill losses. So I, um, lost, uh, drew this random game against Admech mm. downhill with the OP CSM, then against fire flame storm. I lost with the, oh, with the yeah. CSM. We list. both lost to that guy. <laughs> yeah. um, I lost with Eldar on a completely open board, super shooty against Josh's random Space Wolves. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, which, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's no way I should be losing that game. And now we're here and I'm playing Sisters of Battle against Manny's Chaos Demons. This could not be more stacked in my favor, <laughs> to be honest. This is like 20 0 maximum win territory, this matchup. Mm -hmm. um, and we played on Burden of Trust. Burden of Trust, mm -hmm. you can only score points for objectives in the middle of the board. The I would have thought that was like pretty good with many, for many, though, right? Like he's got the great and clean one, yeah. you know. It's it's okay, uh, yeah. but you know the great and Cleveland still only like it's got some OC, but you can get a few points. But the person going second gets the massive advantage uh, on this. Yeah. They okay. get secret missions, etc. Yeah. You know what, Dave? I went second. <laughs> I went second in this game. But there, there's, there's the classico. It's the classico one win condition that demons always have, isn't there? <laughs> oh my god! So yeah, I don't, I don't understand. I went, I went second. I had all the advantage in the world. I knew the rules of this army. I did go in knowing the rules mm -hmm. because I had read the rules. I'd be told the rules. Nice. But what I didn't understand is the effect of not knowing the correct macro strategy to take. And if you do 95% of it, the 5% can mess you up. 
Mm, yep. And it was as simple as me doing my screen, but putting an emulator on an objective along with the unit inside of it. In my, he went first. He kind of ended up having to give up a bunch of his chaff, and he has okay. barely any units in his army already. Cool. So I was like, okay, let's go forward. Now he has to deal with this emulator, dominion, and one seraphim squad. The entire board is screened. Mm. There's uh, there's nowhere that he's going to go and do anything, but. My dominions were next to my emulator. So that was the only out he had was Scarbrand plus the Blood Crushers making a charge and managing to get and touch this emulator. And he did it. And even at that point, the game is fine. He went, I failed my leadership. I couldn't fall back, so I can't shoot this Blood Crusher unit. Fine, not the end of the world. I can shoot something else. But instead of shooting things which are worth shooting, my exorcists were taking chunks out of this great unclean one right in front of my army. And I okay, killed Vic, this. The great unclean one is the last thing you're supposed to kill. <laughs> okay, right. I killed everything that was in front of me, but I could have pushed around a corner and killed Scarbrand. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Scarbrand was probably the key. Mm. And it's as simple as these little things. I killed like, so all his chaff is gone and the great unclean one is gone. But it took my entire army to kill the great unclean one. Mm, yeah. And then um, still, I was like, okay, maybe there's a chance, you know, it's going to be fine. And all it took was one turn when he came down with his blood crushers. And I thought, okay, I'm going to kill two units of blood crushers. I have a full sister's army. Yeah, Everything's alive. I'm going to kill at least two units of blood crushers. They're made, they're not that tough. They're really bad against sister's profiles. And I just about killed one, just about like on the edge with my entire army. Wow. And then, and then the game's gone. That's crushing. Yeah, but it's, it's. I mean, that one turn, let's say out of those three turns, one of those turns I roll low and Manny rolls hot. Hmm. But I made the mistake when I had such an advantage in two turns in a row. I shot the great unclean one with too much stuff and I let him tag an emulator. If I just hadn't put the emulator there, Manny has no place, nothing. He's just, he's already lost the game. If you only screen with one unit, then they can't... Um charge and then consolidate into something that allows a no fallback right because correct they have to kill the blood crushers are going to kill whatever they touch unless they fluff some like six inch and they can't all base and then do something but they even then they still do impact models yeah um so mm. and, and you know the game gets even more crazy than that the blood crushers can kill a front screen right mm-hmm. if i charge it with one emulator and or any of my vehicles and do aoc he is not killing that for the entire game Mm, yeah, are they? Because you can't uh, fall back uh, and shoot. Oh yeah, blood crushers AP one as well. They are, yeah. Oh, oof. Mm. crushed, crushed. Exactly, no reroll wounds, no yep. plus one to wound, nothing. Yeah. So I, I think um, my win conditions were infinite, and his win conditions were one. Yeah. Uh, and he found his one win condition there. I mean, I, I mean, we didn't finish the game. That was probably yep. a factor here. Uh, and I had bottom of turn. So who knows what could have happened? I had one bad turn of shooting. Maybe my turn, which I didn't get to play, I had a really good turn and kill everything. Okay, right, yeah. Because I still had all my vehicles at the end of the game. So mm. we'll never know. But he definitely had the advantage in that game because of my mistakes. Yeah. Um, Demons can be a little bit of a tough one sometimes, right? Like they do present multiple threats. And the threats that they present are definitely not all equal. In fact, some of them are drastically mm. different, right? Which yep. is is kind of tough sometimes. You know, it can be a little bit tempting to be like, oh, you know, I've got an easy line to shoot down here. Or actually, I've got a much harder one, but actually this this uh, target is three to four times as valuable. So it can mm. be a little bit counterintuitive sometimes when you're trying to evaluate what to do, right? And the six-inch screen, you know, the three-inch deep strike does throw a lot of the traditional screen you from deep strike shooting um uh from uh, screen you from deep strike charging out the window right yeah so the three inch deep strike the thing is they can't charge after the three inch deep strike yeah exactly yeah so yeah. really what you're screening is six, six. inches yeah. right because they when they're in shadow of chaos they can deep strike six inches yeah. so that means you're basically doing a 12 inch gap between your kind of screen and your front line of stuff yeah the macro strategy is very simple and the demon army has very few units in it yeah so for them to commit to any kind of play with units that probably won't survive any kind of clapback yep. means that there are a lot of games they should be losing. And yep. on top of that, a lot of the demons units aren't actually infantry. Some of yep. the chaff is, but the blood crushers are not. Mostly the greater mountain. demons are not. Yep. If you stand one inch off a wall, that is already a screen. Yep. Um, so 
And know, if you go second, sorry, I'm not trying to brutalize yeah, yeah. it even more. But if you go second, you can play quite passively and only shoot them when they yeah. commit to the objectives, right? They literally can't do anything. Yeah. So I, I should not be losing this game, and I did. And uh, it's it's a life lesson. <laughs> Tough one to do. I mean, it's, it's not always easy playing from the driver's seat sometimes as well, right? Uh, and, you know, it's it's a big thing because how many people are going to have played Chaos Demons, mm -hmm. especially played by a good player, Yeah. right? Uh, because Man different. Manny still has to find his win condition in an awful matchup. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if I play this game, I can say this as many times as I want. If I play this game one more time, it would be completely different. Yeah. But I'm not going to get to play that game one more time. I've just <laughs> played it my one time. <laughs> and Manny's not going to be playing that game. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, exactly. it's, it's, um, it's kind of funny, like, you know, uh, you know, obviously, like, there's every, every player has their flaws, right? And it's kind of life's irony, sometimes is that you make the same mistake time and time again, sometimes. And, um, you know, like overconfidence or, or whatever it is, right? We've, we've all got the flaws, right? It's kind of one, one of life's ironies is that, you know, trying to work on those is much harder than it seems, mm -hmm. especially if you're in the moment, right? Like, Obviously, yeah. it's quite a like a competitive game. Obviously, you versus Manny as well, right? So, mm -hmm. it, whilst it's easy to look off from the sidelines and be like, "Oh, you should do this, you should do that," uh, it's completely different when you're playing in the moment. Yeah, and, and honestly, while I was playing it, I thought, "Oh my god, I'm a genius! I'm doing everything <laughs> yeah. perfectly." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a tough one, yeah. That's a tough one. How it always, you, uh, it's oh, always sorry. tough when you take an L at LGT as well, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of it's, out of the contention. and you know. Especially because uh, I actually thought my army was really strong, you know? Yeah. I, I had a really good army here. And, um, you know, while I wouldn't say that I necessarily would have had a good run in the top eight, um, certainly my army would have would have put up a fight against anything. Uh, yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. It Definitely. was a strong, strong army. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, Wait. I mean, I... Where you at, Dave? I had a I had a rough day too, man. Uh, just just to put this in context, guys. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the show, I, I was like literally running a fever at the tournament. I was uh, not only was my voice completely fucked, and I, the my voice on stream sounded so much better than my voice in person as well because my microphone is like literally next to my voice box, so it actually <laughs> picked up things. But in, in real life, like probably 60, 70 percent of the words I was saying like actually weren't coming out. I was in horrendous shape when i was playing um but I, we get the pairings and uh round one uh day one was like reasonably cruising i played some awesome people i had a really lovely game against a death guard player uh at the end of day one to cap everything off and that was awesome uh fan of the show as well so it was i was really looking to play him uh, and then day two i get my pairing mm -hmm. and we all we had the ignite team chat and uh i remember saying the ignite team chat i was like man motherfucker i pulled a bad pairing for for round four, man. Obviously, Vic had Manny, uh, but then I had uh, a lovely lady called uh, Kian, uh, who is Ash from Discord. Uh, and Kian and I actually started playing Warhammer around about the same time uh, during the beginning of COVID, uh, the beginning of ninth edition. And she has been a traditionally very strong player on TTS that's moved from Singapore to London. And so, uh, although we've never played before and I've never seen her play in real life, she their team won best newcomer at WTC as well, uh, like New Zealand did the previous year. Uh, I knew that she was a really, really, really strong player. And, you know, in a tournament, I mean, it's always nice to play strong players, but when it really matters for something, you'd rather just have an easy run. Like, you ask any top competitive player, they would rather just have like, a, oh, this is a great matchup. You know, I'm gonna, I play great matchups the whole weekend. Great. Oh, that's awesome, right? Um, but it doesn't always work out like that. So, yeah, I was preparing to play for this game. And... Um, uh, there was a couple of things that struck me in Ash's list. Her list was quite a bit different from all the other sisters' lists, uh, which was good for me because it was different in the way that I'd played against those lists somewhat before because I played mm -hmm. WTC. She had the Paragon War suits and she had uh, Celestine um, as well. Mm -hmm. One 10 man Seraphim. And the thing I noticed about her list was it was a lot more narrow than every other sister's list at the tournament. She mm -hmm. was quite elite and her unit size was quite low comparative to other people. So. She didn't have as much stuff to play around the entire board. So my primary focus was reducing the number of assets as much as possible and then letting my Bulgren play the entire game. There's a couple of key things I need to do for that. I need to lock down the Celestine unit and then I need to kill the Morven Vile unit. Once that's done, the Bulgren are almost unkillable. Mm. Mostly because the map we played on, I can stage the Bulgren from the middle to hit every single objective. So turn four, 
I move each unit out onto one objective. There's basically one castigator or one emulator or some garbage character units left at that point on each objective. The Bulgren go onto those. They hit it down to half HP or a third HP. They clean up some stuff. But most importantly, they're stuck in combat. They control the objective. And we'll, the sisters have almost zero play after that happened. You either fall the tanks back and they can't shoot, or you shoot them cross to cross in and out of combat. Uh, and I can also go to ground in cover um, on top of that as well. And sisters are not great at killing Bulgren, but especially when they're already in combat and you're hitting on fours, it's even worse. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, one thing that happened, and I want to give a huge shout out to Ash. Uh, we played on stream and uh, we both agreed not to use a clock beforehand. We you know we're super comfortable with it. Our game does end up clocking out. And um, the judge called that Ash would win by one point. It was 37-36, but I effectively had the entire board position and I had a guaranteed secret mission at the end. Uh, and uh, Ash was extremely generous and kind enough to, um, to then talk through the game with me. We worked out what my secondaries would be. She had some counterplay. She had her Celestine unit on my home field objective, so she wasn't completely out of the game. Mm -hmm. But I had guaranteed secret plus all the objectives in the middle and then I also had obviously a lot more agency to do secondaries conditions. So we uh, went through the cards, um, did it super fair of what we thought would achieve what. I explained to her that my secret mission was the battle line one, which she had zero battle lines. And I had a battle line unit in my Chimera and on the objective, but nine inches away from a deployment zone as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so we drew the cards. Uh, I think it worked out to be about a six, five or six point win for me. But there was a complete loss condition where I drew absolute duds and she drew gas. And then so, um, yeah, we ended up chatting it out. The only way it was possible for me to technically win was if Ash conceded uh, by the judge. And she was uh, extremely gracious enough to do that. So um, I want to give a huge shout out to Ash because uh, it there was there was obviously judges saying that um, that she had won, but she went the extra mile to, uh, to do that as well. So... Mm -hmm. It's times like that in Warhammer where the sportsmanship stuff kind of goes a long way, you know, and a lot of, I understand that there's a lot of policies around, you should play the game to this, to X, Y, and Z, but at the same time, like we kind of all play Warhammer enough, you know, that mm -hmm. like, I don't really come for a weekend and I compete hard, don't get me wrong, but I don't really come for a weekend to just like only win at all costs or anything like that. Like I'm kind of an adult and if you win the game straight up, cool, man, you know, you win the game. It's, it's all good. And um, I personally don't think talking out a game and trying to be um, really fair on what would happen and what would not to make sure a game is settled um, to its final conclusion and how it would naturally play it is a bad thing. Um, I watch a lot of sports as well. And, you know, it always pisses me off. And when, when the TO misses a call and they don't go back and fix it and they go, wow, it was a two point victory at the end, you know, and, oh, but if the TO had just spent 10 minutes and then gone back and, you know, it would have, it would have, um, it would have, you know, unruined a really great game. Um, that's just my philosophy on it. I know mm -hmm. everyone's got so many different ways of thinking about this, and I don't know if it's a thing we'll ever solve, really. But um, yeah, it's a controversial topic, isn't it? Because it is. You know? I, what I've noticed is, and I think it's a topic that's coming up a lot more now. The chess clocks and clocking mm -hmm. out, and all this stuff is becoming more relevant for tournament play across the board. Is that there are different groups of people, but mm -hmm. I can say from experiencing and seeing the people at the very highest level of the game, the, the, the strongest competitors, you know, the tendency tends to be more towards, okay, time has run out, but you're obviously winning this game. Right. Yeah. And the aim of the clock is not so much a tool that determines who wins the game, but mm. more a tool to make sure the game comes to a conclusion. Yeah. And I think that's a very difficult one because a lot of people are going to be so hardline on this. Maybe, mm. you know, have not have as much experience in 40K and are not going to understand that concept. They're going to like vehemently disagree with what yeah, I just said sure. there. Yeah, 100%. You know, an, an interesting thing, and I will butt in right here, mm. and a lot of people might see that stream and, and say, oh, David got really frustrated. A, a part of me was I was just trying to communicate because my voice was so utterly fucked. But... Um, I've actually, I've actually had a player clock out three times against me uh, mm -hmm. in a position where it was for a final where I lost mm -hmm. in a position for a final where a, uh, a game five where I won but was very high chance that I would lose and then for a draw as well, which I would have won otherwise. Uh, and I let that player uh, play the rest of their turn, do the actions because like I said, and a lot of people don't see this before the stream as well, and this is what I say to everyone, I said, 
all I want to do is have the game play out as if we were to just play our best Warhammer. Because I'd rather you play your best and me play my best and, and us compete at the very best levels and show how we can compete together um, and then have that be a great game and celebrate you know, a, a great game like that. Because um, I think that's the cool part about Warhammer, right? Like, even if you're spectating a game, you're watching someone else's game, you want to see someone like, wow, that player's a great player. Like, wow, I never really considered that. That's a that's a great player. Look how they deployed. Like, oh, that's super interesting. Like, um, but I, like you said, I think everyone's going to have so much different opinions on it, right? Like, yeah. yeah what I would one. say is very interesting is that I spoke to Ash after your game. Sure, yeah. And I said, yo, Ash, you know what, what happened? You know, what, what were you thinking? And she said lots of points, but the one which really stuck in my head was that she said, what I did there wasn't to gain myself brownie points, mm -hmm. but it was to show the community what I think is the right thing to do. Yeah. And I think she's a phenomenal example of the, because the game can go in two directions here. Yep. And I think she's a phenomenal example of what I believe is the better direction for the game to go in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, fair play. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And, um, yeah, I mean, what else can you say? I mean, a great, a great example of the of the of the community as well. And maybe if you're a new player, and I, I don't know how many new players we have listened to the podcast, but you know, it's a common sentiment that's also echoed at like events like the WTC, where you're playing for the highest levels of, uh, I guess there's no money in Warhammer, but the, the highest level of bragging rights. Or you know, if you're you're trying to represent your nation or your country, right, at the very highest levels, that sentiment is only enhanced even at the WTC. I mean, I had games. My, I had a game where my opponent clocked out at WTC. I, mate, I don't care. Just take my time. Who cares, right? Let's just play the game. Even if it could matter my team winning or losing, I told my team beforehand as well. I said, I'm never clocking someone out because I want to see the game reach a conclusion where it will finish as well. And so if, a new, if, you're, if you are a newer player, be aware that that is a lot of times a very common sentiment um, at those levels. So, yeah. yeah. I, so I'm going to give a direct example because I think that might confuse people a little bit here. Mm. I think there's a big difference between, you know, there's 10, 15 minutes left on the clock on one side in a really heated game and the person's winning the game mm -hmm. um, versus uh, kind of you have one minute left on your clock and your opponent's just clocked out mm -hmm. and you only win the game because they because you've got that one minute where they can't do any actions. Yeah, There's some very different nuances between that that's going to be very hard for us as a community to unravel. Mm. But what I would say is that winning because you actually won the game is much better than winning because of a technicality. We've already got rid of this gotcha play, poor kind of cheating, sportsmanship. All, all of that has really improved in the game. The next one is how we use clocks and time management going forward yep. in the game. And I don't have the correct answer for it. Who at does? The moment. It's tough, uh, isn't it? But we have to see which direction we go as a community. But let's try and keep it positive yeah yeah i mean yeah so like you know it was um an awesome showing bash as well so i'm really hopeful that we'll play again i'm sure that she will do very well uh here in the uk when she plays more as well um and uh, a great representative for a country in singapore as well yeah so that was my round four uh i had about four shots of whiskey during that game as well so oh, <laughs> oh boy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thanks joe for that one as well uh and by the way we forgot totally forgot to mention but joe from war games live was obviously there if you didn't know mm -hmm. um the guy is literally a pillar of the community like i joe has advanced the warhammer community in so many ways that i don't even know that he fully appreciates yet uh that um you know we're so lucky because joe is just one enigma of an individual like there's a there's another parallel universe where joe makes the decision to keep doing whatever he wants to do for a living instead of the crazy decision to live in an rv and stream warhammer all the time <laughs> like do you, like we are so incredibly lucky to have someone like Joe facilitate for our entertainment uh, tournaments like this. It's uh, it's crazy, uh, crazy. So big shout out to Joe, of course, man. Big Joe, guy's a fucking legend, bro. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So my day two goes on to uh, yeah. So you know, a super hard game, and then I get Kyle Grundy on Tau on uh, on <laughs> Crucible of Battle. So yeah, that's uh, not exactly an easy game, I would say. Uh, round five was pretty difficult. I go first as well, which is not the best. Um, Kyle deploys really well. I, my, my scout sentinels are pretty good in that game, though, because I can like force them to shoot them. They can shoot oh, nice and then respawn. Uh, <laughs> my one scout sentinel on turn one hits with the last cannon, hits with the hunter killer, wounds with both. Kyle fails both saves, and I'm like, yes. And there was like, 
I think like t- uh, 10 damage to a hammerhead on turn one. I was like, oh, sick. Nice. <laughs> so um, that was pretty good. Uh, ended up being a about a 10 point victory for me in that one. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, happy to do that. And um, Tau was, it was kind of, it was just another typical game where uh, turn four, I just push everything in the middle uh, and then just try and slow down as much as possible uh, with an already kind of points advantage here as well while blocking mm-hmm. whatever secret mission he can do or something as well. So there we go. So Kyle Grundy round five. And then I had a little bit of an easy game after this one. Um, just, uh, you know, just Alex Harrison on Blind Angels next <laughs> um, for round six. So uh, those of you who don't know, Alex is an extremely good uh, player, regardless of whether or not he says he uh, is just going to go home and, you know, can't be bothered playing the final. I don't believe any of that bullshit. <laughs> no. <laughs> or, or I'm just going to send my whole army forward. Um, no, Alex is an extremely good player and, def- and knows what he's doing much better than I do probably. Uh, so... What, what I would say is this, this would be one critique for LGT is that the round six and seven boards were, mm-hmm. to me, very clearly not playtested maybe even once because those round six and seven boards were atrociously bad. Uh, round six was the densest of dense boards I've ever seen in my life. And it was hidden supplies where you could hold, you could literally hold two objectives behind a completely closed uh, Super L with a fucking battle wagon. Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, so that board was mega dense. So I get the entire Blood Angels army going second on the densest board possible. Uh, I managed to win that game by, uh, we talk it out, I just need to do one action and move my Scout Sentinel to get uh, the secret mission. And then I win by three points. So it's about a three to six point victory on that one. Mm-hmm. Very tight game where... Uh, I had the Scion Rapid Ingress and uh, Overwatcher unit when it was on an objective to charge me and killed like five guys. So the mm-hmm. Scion unit pulled mega weight that one. I actually misplayed that one. I could have won probably a bit more, but I, for some reason, just forgot to use my Scout Sentinels to block all my Bulgren that are pre-screened. If I had done that, Alex would have had to crack into the Scout Sentinels. I would have probably had like another five Bulgren alive. Mm-hmm. So a um, bit of a tough matchup for uh, Alex there. Uh, although he did play very well and it was an absolute pleasure to play against as well so um big shout out to alex yeah, it was a super fun game actually nice. uh and then yeah round seven uh i had tau with my good friend lewis smith with the tiger shark uh mm-hmm. lewis is a very good player um, yes. very sharp guy and a very good player he actually played with us when we went to cardiff for the team event as well um now under normal circumstances this probably would have been an okay game and and tau is a perfectly fine game to play it like you're just there you're playing warhammer You've got better secondary and primary control, but they're going to try and come back later into the game on four and five. You've got to manage the plane a little bit. But unfortunately, round seven, the board layout was uh, utterly <laughs> atrocious. Like, yeah, I don't want to share a picture of this board, but this board was beyond awful. Like, mm. I would rather play on LVO player place terrain with the fucking hanger thing that doesn't do <laughs> anything. Like, at least I could have had some control over holding an objective. Like, it was, I, I rocked up to the board and I joked Lewis, I was like, well, this is going to be a bit of a fast game because I, every single objective in the middle of the board was uh, was completely open. There was <laughs> there were ruins on it, but they were parallel to the board edge and we're playing on hammer and anvil, tipping point, whatever. So there was effectively no ruins in the middle of the board. And obviously Lewis's army is a bit better than shooting at mine. Um, so yeah, it was a bit, of a, a bit of a sad way to go out, but obviously I played Lewis. So it was a fun, super fun, chill <laughs> game. But it was... A little bit of maybe quality control of those at those rounds where I would I wish they would just duplicate a, a mission for the shadow round because only there's only like six people that play it at most so mm-hmm. I mean who, none of these players are going to complain that it's just oh it's just search and destroy again okay cool well we all know that can play but on top of that we're also playing linchpin so holding the middle objective is the most important thing in the game so Lewis goes first and just puts devilfishes on the furthest away objective. And then I have absolutely zero recourse because the staging ruins are so far away from the, mm-hmm. the objectives anyway. So, yeah, it was uh, inc- yeah, it was a, a nigh impossible task to win that game. So, at the same time, it's a little bit frustrating to lose to a board, but at the same time, it was you know it was all good fun to lose to a friend as well. So I was happy to see Lewis go to the top eight, uh, who then uh, went on to beat Nassim on Persia Foe Crucible of Battles, uh, Crucible of Battle as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, fantastic showing by Lewis as well. Um, absolutely awesome chap so super happy to see him do well nice yeah perfect that was a great run man great run but you know in that top eight 
No, it was some uh, some interesting factions. Yeah, is sure. what I would say. Because uh, ultimately, the the winner of the tournament was Liam VSL, uh, mm-hmm. winning back to back tournaments. Congratulations, back. Liam! Uh, including winning the invitation, actually, which yep. was uh, pretty wild. That game against Innes was really good. If people want to watch one, that was a good one. Um, but yeah, so Liam played against Brian, and Brian was playing Warhorde Orcs. Oh, orcs, mate. Oh, my God. God that faction is so shit. Start <laughs> collecting Orc boxes straight there. And oh. uh, what does a Big Mac do? Runs through your screens. <laughs> and that was a great bit of innovation. Brian uh, sure. Brian absolutely smashed it. Become second place with that is, is nuts. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I, th- I think that's really telling about the state of the game that we're in, of course, yeah. right? Imagine you if know. you had a good army. Imagine if you had a good army. <laughs> But the, okay, but here's the here's the serious question, all right? <laughs> I'm teasing. Imagine if you had a <laughs> imagine if you had a better army that everyone had played against before. Correct. It becomes a That's worse the army. Is, mm. is that a better army? Is that a better army? Is that a worse army? I think it's a worse army. I think it's a worse army too, as well. Where are the Dark Angels? Where are the Death yeah. Knights? Where's Ed? the sisters? Where's the sisters? Everybody I... wants to kill sisters' vehicles. Yeah, it's um. It's an interesting conundrum, and you as a player, you can fall on whatever side of the fence you want to fall on in this one. But I'll tell you what, um, there is something to be said about not being comfortable about the army that you're playing against when someone extremely good is playing it. Mm-hmm. it, it kind of, obviously, we're all playing Warhammer, and there's win rates this and win rates that. But the reality is, is that to to actually have that win rate equal what will happen in the game. Both players need to have a level of knowledge and understanding. But when you play an army that almost no one has had a good, well, no one has had a play test experience against of someone at your level, that is, you know, very unusual. um, The information asymmetry of the macro strategy is completely different. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is a hugely powerful tool, I think, as well. It takes a great player to uh, capitalize on that, though. Mm -hmm. It must be said. But you just got to play good core Warhammer. Yeah. And that is what the Warhorde does. It does. You get and a lot of stuff in Warhorde, man. It's not just the Warhorde, Dave. That's what uh, Liam's CSM list does. Oh, yes. It's full of nonsense that you would never have seen before. And you just play it right, it does the work. Yeah. I think that's it's an important point, eh? Like, fundamentally at the moment, we've, we've foregone an era of stat checky, gimpy, strong ability, you know, stuff like that, right? Where actually the core tendencies of being able to attack objectives, play secondaries, have damage output, have uh, dynamic playability, dynamic threats is actually what you're seeing succeed in the majority of the time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got obviously, I think Admic, uh, Johnny Simmons, uh, what a Mm -hmm. beast. Uh, That's a bit of an unusual skewer list. And you've got Andy uh, on Necrons here as well. That's one people prepared for, I would say. But Mm -hmm. the Innes' GSC? Yep. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is those... Those skewer lists are, uh, it's no surprise that you see them uh, make it in, but sorry, uh, Johnny Simmons list in particular, you know, mm-hmm. when's the last time you played against a good Admic player? Nope, never. I've literally never played against Admic in 10th edition, so. Yes, <laughs> and actually Johnny is the uh, the person I, lo- I drew against, that Admic player. I, oh, shit. The random Admic was Johnny. Oh, uh, so yeah, good. I know it all comes around. Wow. That's a story, that one. Oh, gosh. One thing yeah. I thought was interesting <laughs> it was also uh, Alex Fowler um, playing oh, Thousand Sons. Yes. Uh, I saw him play on stream. Really good. I've actually I chatted to him maybe a, must have been six months ago. Um, he's been playing Thousand Sons for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was actually surprised that he went with the Mutalith Beast, two Mutalith Beasts. He went with a somewhat similar style with me. I had the 19 point critical break point and then, two, and then Mutalith Beasts after that. Mm-hmm. But he went with more Zangors uh, in line for the move block potential on top of that as well, which mm-hmm. I actually really like his list. Uh, yeah, he had, he had a, as well. Okay, I don't like the Demon Prince, but... but a stealth Demon Prince, not the jumpy one. Stealth Demon Prince? Yes, the stealth yeah. aura. I mean, he's done fantastically, so what what can you say about it? But um, I don't know if I would play that, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting take because I would have actually thought that the stronger Thousand Suns list would have been the more Alexandra Sacco style, maybe one to two Rhino, 20 Cabal point lists. Um, but we've obviously seen uh, actually Alex lost uh, in the round four or five uh, and and Alex Sacco. And then Alex Fowler has done very, very well with the Mutalith Beast still. So mm-hmm. counterintuitive to what I would have thought, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, T-Suns are a weird one. I don't think, you, uh, in my opinion, you know, 
Should I'm you have played t Sons Vic? No. Oh my God, no way. I think t Sons are one of the most overrated factions at the moment. Yeah. That is that is the, the hottest of hot takes, which oh. the entire world will like disagree with me. <laughs> but I think t Sons are completely fine at the moment. And I'm not playing them. They're, they're, they're packed up. They're in the attic, guys. <laughs> they're in the attic. They're in the attic because I don't think they're good enough at the moment to actually go all the way and win tournaments on any kind of consistent basis. They have so many bad matchups if your opponent knows what they do. Mm. And T-Suns are not niche enough at the moment that people don't know what they do, especially mm. the good players. Fair, fair. Uh, so I think they're going to fall apart a little bit. I mean, I saw Alex play against Ed Watts, and Ed Watts was running basically Jack Tithe, my sister's mm -hmm. variant with the two exorcists. That's a very good game for the sisters. Mm -hmm. Ed had played one game with that sister's list and built it the week before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the week before LGT. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of... Uh, you need you need a bit of luck as you go through these tough sure. games that you're bound to hit with the T Suns. Um, it's no surprise as you know Saka couldn't make it through either. So yep. uh, Alex also had the buy as well, so mm -hmm. immediately making him to the top four after the top eight um, as well. Nice, um, yeah, fair play to him. But yeah, yeah, I I think T Suns will drop off hard against good players at the moment. I don't know what you think, Dave. What do you think? Do you think they're still really solid? I, I would still play them in an eight-man lineup for WTC. With singles. For singles, I mean. For singles. Um, if I was playing in the UK, I wouldn't play them, no. Um, especially if Nassim and I were attending an event, for sure. I think the guard yeah. matchup is quite tough. Right. Guard matchup is bad. Yep. With all these sisters players running two Xs, I think that is awful. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. And then what, what, are you, what are you winning? <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough, yeah. I think the UK is slightly unique as well. Actually, a lot of the good players, uh, well, sorry, a lot of the very top players have actually played T Suns before as well. Mm -hmm. And it, and I think you see that play out when yes. Alex played against Liam. Uh, I when I watched that game as well, I thought, mate, you need to be you need to be so aggressive as T Suns here. Like you're as soon as you go first in that game, you need to reevaluate your entire game plan to be the chance, the way that I win this game, the out. Is that I play aggressive with Magnus. I get luckier on a couple of dice roll where I blank some damages and he survives a turn longer than he should. And then you snowball a game and block the reserves off the board uh, after that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's yeah. so hard to do that Tough. while because you immediately lose momentum, right? Because you yep. can't fire indirectly at the nonsense hiding behind the wall. Yep. So you're immediately trading down the second you go aggressive with T Suns. Yep. Uh, I very, would have YOLO'd on turn one, I would have YOLO'd Magnus right to the bottom of. Uh, um, Alex's ruin, um, uh, Liam's ruin with mm -hmm. the one rhino in it, and I would have just tried to doom bolt the rhino, uh, maybe doom bolt it twice uh, or doom bolt it once, and then kill it with um, with Magnus, mm -hmm. and then tried to solidify and block out anything from coming around that side of the board. Yeah, yeah. Um, Magnus is your only out for uh, initial play. Yeah, that, you need that to, lets you, you need maintain momentum. Yeah, you need to roll them with Magnus for a long time, and he needs to he needs to make some good saves. You know. Against the yeah. Laz Cannons. You just, you just need to be saving them. Yeah. Um, and Ooh. to see that line of play is very difficult, though. It's obviously very easy from an outsider's perspective, mm -hmm. just watching a game. No relaxing, stress. Right? Yeah. Yeah, Not exactly. thinking about 100 things. It's completely different, right? Yeah. Mm. All righty. So should we go down to uh, what we thought under Prawn really quickly? I thought Drakari would do really well. Uh, but actually, uh, Alex Fowler bet our teammate um, Yoko on uh, Dark Aldo as well, actually. So it is a good matchup for T-Suns, especially if you have the double Mutalith Beast. That's a, a very, it is quite a tough one for Dark Elder. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mutalith Beast soaks so much damage, have so many good profiles. They have 15 attacks in combat. <laughs> like, if, if you wanted the best unit in the game against D Dark Elder, probably a Mutalith Beast. Yeah. But it, in this case, if he did, had played against Sako, I would feel the Drakari have the advantage on that one. You think so? I think so. With the no mutilates. I yeah, think. to be fair, the Void Raven Bomber is very good, the more rubrics mm -hmm. you have as well, to be fair. So. Yeah. So interesting one. Yeah, it could have gone either way. And I, and I think, you know, Yoko, you know, another day, he might have won that game anyway. For sure. Uh, we had Tau at the top. Well, one of the top that we thought would overperform. Mm -hmm. uh, I would. I think it's safe to say. Tau was our number one, wasn't Tau it? Tau was our number one. Or yeah. was it Tau or Sisters? Let's just, uh, I think it was Tau. Eh? I'm going to bring up the previous video. Man. Oh, uh, fact check. Oh, look, here we go, here we go. Oh, mate. Is it? Tower's our number one. Tower's number one for overperforming. How Lewis, good at this game are we? Man? Lewis took it off. There we Almost go. all the way. It's beautiful. I, I think Tower are actually really strong at the moment. Mm -hmm. And 
later on in the show, I think Riptide should go up a little bit in points because uh, Riptide's are really freaking good, man. Like, holy, they put a Lehman Rust battle tank to fucking shame, dude. Oh my god. Yeah, you, you need to play them beautifully, the the Tau, to actually get anything out of it. But yeah, works yeah. in singles. By beautifully, you mean put them near the line and then say you can move ten and shoot because you have fall back and shoot. And the ten. main thing is you need to know when to shoot, ah, and the yeah. hardest bit is knowing the turns not to shoot. Ah, yeah. It is not when you shoot; it is when you do not shoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we had sisters and necrons and chaos demons. Uh, we had chaos demons overperforming, which I think is probably fair to say. I think they probably did. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe we don't have any imagine. statistics, really. I mean, yeah. what do you think about the sisters' question? Did they perform well? I think they underperformed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There was eight demons in the top 100, Ooh, which is actually the most. Good. That's a lot. Faction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So very. Well. I think the demons are great, uh, and. Mm. I think the sisters, I mean, you'd have to put them as underperforming. Ah, because we were we were expecting them to make the top cut, you know? Yep. Um, and I think they had a lot of 4-1s, a huge number of 4-1s. Okay. Uh, so even if you look at the overall statistics for the week, 11, uh, yeah. sisters had uh, no tournament wins at all, mm -hmm. but they had an extremely high win percentage and the highest 4-1 four, four uh, record Yep. Uh, out of any faction. So very good army. But not quite making it all so, the way. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Like, what? When does an army need to be adjusted? Is it when it is it when it's winning the biggest events, or is it when it mm. has a very such a consistent X and one? Right. Mm. It's a tough one, right? It's a tough one, but I don't think you can go wrong with anything, because yeah. while sisters are a bit naughty, you know, there's a <laughs> lot of stuff which is naughty in the meta, uh, but none of it's naughty enough to break the meta. Yeah. So which any. Is good. Any kind of adjustment is going to be fine. If you over nerf it, you know what? Someone is going to come up with a funky sisters build with the stuff that is not nerfed. And I think the mechanics of the army, the miracle dice, etc., are so strong that yeah. you know, if for sisters players out there, I think they will get hit extremely hard, mm -hmm. very likely based on yep. the noise. Uh, but you know, it's not the not going to be the end of the world for sure. Uh, looking at the underperform, we have Thousand Suns, which I think. Yeah, uh, maybe a little, a little bit off the mark. It's difficult to say, uh, but there are not a uh, ton of Thousand Suns in the top 100. Uh, Blood Angels, which I think underperform is true. We had Tyranids underperforming, which I think is true as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't. I didn't really hear any reckonings of people scrapping for the uh, top cuts in Tyranids. Uh, Orcs, we had as underperform, but we did caveat that with Brian. The yeah. ability, uh, the exception to the rule. So, mm -hmm. arguably, bang on on that one. <laughs> Brian is S tier, isn't he? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Orcs are obviously one of the strongest armies in the game. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we had a bunch of stuff like in the middle on par. And I think um, you could argue that guard, oh, well, yeah, it depends. If, aside from Nassim and I, um, I'm not sure how many. I think overall God performed well. You know, you, you you both did really well. You can only do really well, you know, yep. uh, with an army that is known, which God is. Yep. You can only really do really well with it if it is actually good. Yeah, there was only six in the top one in the top ninety four actually, which given how popular the faction was, is actually a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, we had players reaching quite high and deep into the tournament with it. So exactly what we had thought, what we thought in a lot of ways is that. There's a lot of um, guard players that don't make it into the top, you know, X and one or X and two. Um, yeah. But despite that, the faction still has a lot of depth to it and can run really far in the tournament. Yeah. I mean, as a takeaway, I think uh, you were right earlier in the podcast to say that, you know, faction specialists have a strength here, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they're faction specialists in an army that's not well known. Yep. Awesome. There we go. All right. Now time for the real spice. Oof. Here we go. Here we go. What do we want to see in the balanced data slate? Should we? Do you want to go faction by faction, or do you want to just just, just hot five? takes, the hottest of takes, the hottest of takes? Go on, Dave. Give me your oh. single hottest take here. Oh, single hottest, single spiciest, single spiciest. I genuinely think the Riptide needs to go up twenty points. Oh my god, brutal! Yeah, or or something brutal. in the Tau Codex, like the Chaff units, maybe need to go up slightly, a little bit too mm. much. That army's really good. Like. I might even play that army. It's really good, man. Like, holy, they get a lot of stuff. Like, Piranha's so cheap. They get so much stuff to play the mission. They've got a lot of good profiles. So 
I think that the Riptide should go up. Every list that I see plays three of them. It's it's like where you start the list. Um, I, I can't remember the last time I saw a list without three Riptides. Even the Rick Cadre list play three Riptides. It's clearly the strongest centerpiece unit uh, in that army, I think. So that's the hottest. That's as hot as they come from me, mate. Do we have access to rule changes or is it just points? Just points, I believe, yeah. Just let's assume points. it's just points. Sure. Okay. So let's go for the hottest of hot takes. Oh. I think that Bulgren should go up 30 points. Well, that's not that hot, man. I mean, even though, <laughs> fuck, mate. Even though I agree with that. What? <laughs> I was I was thinking 20 and I thought, let me make it spicy. Let's go 30. 30 points? Uh, oh, oh. 30 points. Is yeah, that a bit too much? I appreciate that. I think 20 points, you just cut 60 points from your list. You play the exact same list. Mm. 30 points, you play 663 instead of 666. But you still play them. That's how good they are. That's how important they well, are for that faction. No, yeah. Okay, the two things are, are different. There's a bit of nuance between the two points you made, though. Mm. How important it is, is to a faction is different from how good they are in the totality of the Warhammer spectrum as well, of course. Right. There is literally no other melee unit in the... <laughs> well, there's Rough Riders. Okay. That is not a unit. Uh, but there is almost nothing in an army that has zero access to fallback and shoot. Uh, this is an is... interesting one because I think they're what makes Guard competitive. I think Guard have a lot of good stuff. They have a lot, a lot of good stuff, but they're the thing that tip Guard over into being competitive rather than just good. What okay, think? interesting. I think if Guard didn't have cheap OC and transports, they would be just as bad if they didn't have Bulgren. True, true. Because that's actually what wins you every single game, trust me. It's the move block, the OC, random grenades, all that random junk. So they it's a combination so... of the two. Yeah. Their, their shooting is not actually that great. Like We've all had those guard games where your opponent shoots everything. You're like, well, none of it fucking hit, mate. So mm. what are we doing here? But if you it's... were going to balance it, I guess it makes sense to aim for the Bulgrin rather than for the cheap OC and transports, right? Yep, yep. Mm. I, I think... It, it's it would be more interesting if the counter melee units were more better priced so mm. if for example like like the cool thing in guard in the end of ninth edition was that you had access to melee relics that you could put on command squads like if they had that as enhancements then you would actually have to invest into a command squad that had a melee relic and a melee option in it you know i i wish the melee units were slightly worse but also were more, more diversified across data sheets mm -hmm. um so maybe if rough riders went down ogren went down bulgrim went up Straken went down, Sly Marbo went down. Like some of these cool thematic characters are just like on the cusp of like, well, you would rather just play 10 Catachan Jungle Fighters and move block your opponent and play that way because that's actually how the codex is written, incentivizing mm -hmm. you to play. Because would you rather play Straken, who sure can reroll all hits and wounds, but they AOC and kills like three Marines, or would you just move block that unit for a whole turn and mm -hmm. have OC and play the mission and shoot it later? Um, and that's the way that the codex incentivizes you, I think. Spicy. There we go. What would I like to see go down? Um, oof. Obviously, some factions are kind of struggling a little bit at the moment. I think the Knight versions are not doing too well and Custodes are not doing too well at all. Oh, um, you know, the uh, faction that was uh, over-nerfed, in my opinion, misunderstood. <laughs> my beloved Eldar. <laughs> misunderstood, my friend, because they were absolutely dominating the meta and then people thought, oh, here comes Pariah Nexus. They can no longer advance and do actions mm. they can no longer fire and fade and do actions and you know what i heard everyone say eldar are going to be so good at the mission in pariah nexus this is true actually and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna you know bite my own words here is that i was one of these people in our team chat that also said but they in pariah nexus they'll be able to do all the secondaries really well uh and i was completely wrong on that one and um, two of the secondaries are you have to survive a turn and let yes. me tell you dave eldar cannot Awful. survive a turn yep. <laughs> and everyone knows everyone knows nowadays that as soon as they start doing recover assets outside their deployment zone you fucking <laughs> you're the whole army yeah, yeah. Yeah. you stuck with that card mate <laughs> <laughs> nothing feels better than making your opponent stick with a card for the next turn and uh, uh, you know you fail the action if you phantasm yep there's there's literally no escape so it's, um I think you're. I think you're dead right. And I remember a couple of episodes back too. I also said I would love it if the characters were cheaper, but the units were the same price. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's so much cooler if there's lots of different weird characters that have all these weird different abilities. Mm -hmm. Then if it's just like three warp spiders, three shadow specters, three swooping hawks, three of this, three of that, three of this, three of that, and it's just like you're, you're winning because you have twenty five units on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's kind of sad, isn't it? That that is the. Uh... 
Oh, at the moment, the play style is very, it's, it's, it, you can make a fun list, but it's very hard to make a competitive list. Yep. And um, I thought Eldar were going to be balanced just off Pariah Nexus, but I was the only one who thought that. Hmm. Um, so now we're in a situation where it's a little funky. Um, yep. And I don't think it can really be fixed, to be honest. Yep. I think it's just got to wait till the Codex, unfortunately, Eldar players. Historically, the Codex has been absolutely broken as Every a crap, though. So, you know, <laughs> okay, right. Um, Hot take. Obviously, I think Necrons obviously need a hit in some regard. Um, the mm. the hybrid crypt lists are really really strong. I actually think they they're like reasonably straightforward to pilot. Mm -hmm. they, they're quite forgiving. I think the monolith should go up. The Tesseract Vault is difficult because it's it's playable and it, or it's unplayable on some terrain formats. Uh, the real linchpin of those is maybe like the hex mark needs to go up. Death marks need to go up a little bit. Because these are just, these are what enable the hypercrypt list to also score points at the same time. I think mm -hmm. I would like to see them go up a little bit as well, personally. Now, okay, I agree with you on the Necrons. I am very interested to hear what you think about CSM. Oh, that's a tough because one. I think CSM are going to get potentially buffed based on win rate. What? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Based on win rate. Yeah. I mean, I don't agree with it, but what do you think, uh, Dave? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> mental. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? This is one of those things where I would you have to be careful what the community say. Because as soon sure. as the CSM points came out, everybody said CSM are bad, right? Yeah. yeah. As soon as they got uh, nerfed. And then all of a sudden, a cursed cultist, whatever, is absolutely dominating, winning yep. super majors here, dominating WTC. Yep. Um, and then now you've got Liam winning LGT, not with the accursed cultist, with something else. Yep. CSM, man, they've got some play. They have so much play to them as well. And a lot of people uh, kind of misunderstood this one. I saw this going around when, when people would talk as well about Liam and his list, is that they would say, oh, Liam, you know, he picked all this random, like random fluffy characters, uh, and he wanted to play CSM because he wanted to win with it back to back, and that'd be cool. L Liam is obviously a very competitive player, and he writes lists all the time. And uh, he tried lots of different lists, and I'm sure that Liam played that list because he thought that that was the best list to win the tournament. Not because it was fluffy or he wants to play Huron or whatever like that, because he knows in his head that that is situationally going to be very powerful to, on, into a very specific meta and give him lots of play. Uh, so I don't think that's a valid argument for saying CSM still need buffs, for example, right? Um, mm. I heard a wild opinion that Warp Talon should go down. Like, I don't think that's... Please. <laughs> um... I don't. Th I think CSM are in a perfectly fine space. If I'm being 100 percent honest, I almost wouldn't touch them. Oh, ACDCs need to go up for sure. Yeah, that's that one is completely fair. I think, I think I agree the, with you. the list that Liam played, I think, is just straight up and down, combined arms regiment. Mm -hmm. um, it's got shooting combat. You know, I think it's perfectly fine to be honest with you. Yeah. I could see the the predator go up maybe five or ten, just as a little bit of attacks, because I think that shooting with the sustained is you know, it does shoot a lot better than what its points are. Uh, mm -hmm. And the melee in that list is already quite strong as well. So it would be what funny if mean? everything uh, goes down in points, eh? Yeah, that would be bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure where that would come from. Deathwing Knights, I think, probably need to go up a, up a tiny little bit. JPIs, Junk jump Pack Assault yeah. and Scissors, need to go mm -hmm. up, definitely. Those things are way under-costed. Um, whenever a unit is like, yo, I'd probably play that in my army if I had access to it. Um, you know, I think the Middle Earth Beast needs to go back up. To the original i put it at 160 probably yeah and t-suns is interesting i mean i gave my hot take on t-suns what do you think balance wise do you think they should have widespread points increases because a lot of people think they're absolutely broken dave uh especially what? america they think they're absolutely busted in america yeah that's weird isn't it yeah um yeah they, I, they're diff to me in my head they're definitely not absolutely busted the indirect nerf was an enormous nerf mm -hmm. uh and if you weren't a WTC, maybe you didn't appreciate that, but I used it every single turn I as it much as time. I could. Like it was broken. But a lot of people, and I've discussed this topic with a lot of people because I'm the only one, it feels like, who's saying the T-Suns are not extremely strong. They're just a good army. Yeah. Um, everyone says like, oh, people never use the indirect fire. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, but if a competent player who's not scared of you realizes that you can't displace them fully from behind a wall, if that's yep. where you stage... How are you possibly winning a game with an army made of tissue paper? Yeah, no, you're not. No. Very tough. Uh, especially if they go second and they just camp behind a wall and then secret mission you at the end anyway. Um, it's mm -hmm. tough. Yeah, for sure. Because how do you dig people out behind walls after that? 
Uh, I don't know. I think Black Templars uh, need to go up. The the Horde list, you know, that should that should just get put up. I think as well. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, once those things get touched a little bit, I think we'll be in a good position. Yeah, I think I, everything I, else is a luxury right here. It's just like yeah. you can do this, you can do that. It doesn't really matter. It's just kind of cool, which is a great yeah. place to balance from. You, you know what I'd like to see is I, I would like if they they fuck they they focus on a couple of key units right and i think the key units for us between vic and i would probably be bulgren deathwing knights acdc those three uh, to say. and i think a bunch of the sister stuff as well oh, to be yeah honest. sorry sorry yeah maybe like, like the triumph sure. let's say the triumph and the castigator sure. yeah okay cool so that's like four armies and four units and four armies that are obviously linchpins and get played all the time right i think once you go there i think it's actually that that's that would move factions up and down the hierarchy of where people think they are strong right mm. but after that i actually think that it's more about they should focus on balancing internally within uh their army right now guard is like a super easy example of this a bunch of stuff that is just wildly over costed and garbage and would be really cool to run and some stuff that's a bit too cheap right so i would be fine if they put katachan jungle fighters up five ten points even even though that's a staple unit, if they brought some other stuff down, right, where it was more playable, like the Valkyrie or, or you know, whatever, right? Maybe aircraft is a bad example, but something that wouldn't move the faction either up or down, mm -hmm. but would um, would make it more via more variance in the uh, in the faction itself, which mm -hmm. is a tough is a tough ask, obviously, because obviously that would move the faction up or down as well. But I think oh, an easy way of achieving that is looking at things that are obviously overcosted and haven't been looked at for ages. And just having a quick revamp over them, right? Being like, well, why is the dish right 180 points? Okay, well, you could probably make that 130 until the codex comes out. And then, if, you know, it's not going to break the game or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's a lot of stuff in a lot of factions like that, probably. Especially with some of the older ones, like, you know, Space Marines, Codex Space Marines. Like, you know, you could make, like, Reavers. I don't know, Reavers, whatever, right? Like, I don't know, make them cheap or something, right? Like, who's going <laughs> to, no one's going to be, you know, a thing like that, right? So... I don't know. Maybe that's a hot take, but yeah, that's think? a good take. Have yeah. some, have some spice, you know. Have some some spice in your life. I wonder what the comment section is going to be like on this oh, one. Oh man, we've made some controversial topics, uh, co comments, but we've kind of dispersed them such that they're hidden. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like people will look at this whole episode and be like, you know what, those guys are reasonable. Whereas if they just skip forward to certain points and hit the wrong spot, yeah. We were fairly unreasonable at times. Unreasonable. <laughs> yeah. Wild takes. Wild <laughs> takes. Here's here's the recap. If you only fucking watch it, oh the recap. no. We think the clock is uh, you know is is an issue that not is is by the way is not drama is not controversial is not uh, a massive issue or anything like that. I, one thing that I really hate is that when people watch something and they make and this actually happened and they make something saying there was some drama or whatever like that when. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was no drama. It was just like, okay, we're both adults. We chat about something. Thanks for being a really nice person. Really appreciate that. You're a great, you're a great person. And then it's resolved amicably, right? Like that's actually the opposite of drama. So when, when people do stuff like that, you're actually a part of the problem. If I'm being completely honest, and you no, know, I'm not going to say I've, I haven't made that mistake before. I, I probably made that mistake when we did the episode and I was too harsh on GW and critiquing them and and uh, and Josh and everything. I made that mistake. Fully, fully own and mid up to it. But the reality is, is that you, you can oftentimes, for the sake of creating content, uh, actually be a part of the problem. Um, so that's one thing. But that's that's definitely something that you know I think will continue to evolve as well. But at the same time, the game's in a pretty good state at the moment, right? Like <laughs> everyone's having a everyone's having fun. There's you know the most diverse top sixteen or whatever it is. Uh, it feels like you've got any skin in the game you want. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Warhammer is pretty fun, even though I'm playing less of it nowadays than I maybe ever have, to be honest. Yeah. Warhammer is a brilliant hobby, and I'm really glad it is thriving as well as it is, because it growing. is thriving, absolutely thriving. It's growing as well, and, and a lot of new people are coming into the game, bringing their ethoses of games that they have previously played into Warhammer. Mm -hmm. I think you've been playing some Space Marine 2, right? Mate, Space Marine 2 is phenomenal. I am, <laughs> I, I am actually very frustrated because I have always historically been good at video games in my life <laughs> and i thought i would be good at space marine 2 very straightforward player versus player experience it should be fine a little bit ad strafing yep. uh but uh, i'm not i'm quite bad 
Uh, so now that's what consumes all my thoughts. Um, and I realized that my one strength in life is now not a strength. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working through some things at the moment, mate. So, <laughs> but that is a very good game, guys. Check out Space Marine 2 while I work out how to be good at it. <laughs> I, I too am getting old. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, the reflexes aren't quite what they oh, were. They're not what they used to be, mate. Oh. That's what I'm Oh my god! I'm trying to aim at someone, and I'm halfway across the other side of the, the map. I could, you know, I could, I could just imagine my 12 year old self like destroying people on Space Marine Two, thinking this guy sucks, <laughs> and it's and it's my 30 year old self on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be like this little shit. <laughs> oh oh Jesus! <dear. laughs> oh god, oh, great. Man. There we go. LGT was an absolute blast. Um, we've got a couple of team tournaments coming up. I'm actually playing in Poland at the Pira Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, by the way, they just reprinted the same old, same old three-inch deep strike on a 10-man guardsman squad that looks busted at 90 points. So fucking let's go, baby. I'm going to be buying some of those. Oh, but... no, it's a little Tempesta Science. Oh, dear. There we go. New data sheet. It's going to be really fun making people not being able to move with a rapid ingress three-inch deep strike. Uh, sick. Because mm -hmm. my army cannot fall back and shoot, and Bulgarin are getting erased, so that's my only way I'll be able to deal with these people that want to kill me in combat. This is going to be fun. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> episode sixty-two. It's been great. If you've uh, if you liked it, oh, we are going to do the stream game by chance as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Vic and I just need to sort out a time for it. I guess we'd always we'd, we'd want to do it before after the points if there's going to be points in, but we don't really know when they are so mm -hmm. maybe if we've got some ideas we could obviously play myself on guard vic on sisters what we played at lgt otherwise we could play something a bit different um how many phoenix lords can i take how many phoenix lords can All you take them. how many lehman russes can i take mate <laughs> eight <laughs> lehman russes versus eight phoenix lords i'm pretty sure i know who wins that fight <laughs> tank shock <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're probably gonna have like a four kill count, so like, he'll be the only one yeah. <laughs> there we go awesome guys episode 62 love you guys have a uh, have a brilliant one and remember if you got to this part of the episode there's a raffle for the uh for the battle for breast cancer uh, as yes. well so please check that out and mm -hmm. give your love and support over there, there see go. you guys next time by the fireside bye